What a great time it is to be alive and, in, and also to be in the house of God with so much faith in the atmosphere. It's, it's incredible what happens when you begin to stretch by faith, what happens to the very atmosphere of your life, the atmosphere of your family. I'm believing that the altitude of what we're living at and thinking at is a little higher as a community just because we are stretching so ferociously by faith that we are, we are moving by faith and we are in a, an incredible vision season. Absolutely incredible vision season. I'm reiterating that because honestly, it's a short season. It's a short season of stretch. We started at what, 28 days ago, 29 days ago, something like that, just stretching by faith and believing for God to do something impossible to, to, to move us as a community. We're an outdoor temporary sanctuary. We've never had a home that we can call our own as a church, but, but God has set us up with an opportunity to move into a building. And I believe by faith that it's our promise. But it's interesting all the way through the Bible, you have to fight for what's yours. The people of God constantly had to fight for what God told them was theirs. Sometimes that's confusing to us. God, You said I'd have it, but I still have to fight for it. Exactly, because we don't fight for, we fight from victory. And God's like, what's the use of being a warrior if you never pick up a weapon? He's given you weapons of warfare that are mighty. And, and so we're stretching as a community to, to, to bridge the $8 million gap. Still sounds surreal when you say an $8 million gap. And uh, I'm excited to let you know that we're already at $5.2 million been committed by this community. That's, that's crazy. I love how cool some of you are. what numbers you live in, what space of economy you live in, but $5.2 million by a lot of faithful people is absolutely incredible to me. And if you're not gonna clap for that, I have nothing for you today that is gonna make you happy. Maybe the fact that already 3.8 million of that has already come in by you faithful folk. So if you are yet to fulfill your commitment. Now is the time. Now is the time to get it in. We are closing towards our deadline. I think we've got something like 12 days left or something like that. 12 days. Man, if God can do this much this far, 12 days. I, how many people think that God is a God of abundance? You know what? I feel a little sheepish. I feel a little sheepish just praying for God to meet the need. I, I wanna pray that God exceeds the need. That we don't just get in, but we get in with renovation money. <laughs> we get in with some remodeling money. Can anybody stretch in their faith just a little bit? Pray in church. Some walking around money, some, some money to change things and move into our community. Wouldn't that be great if we move into a building, we start blessing the community around us and be in the church. Uh, I'm gonna get you happy by the end of today. In fact, let's go to the Bible because last week we started a series, Best Church Ever, more of a theme in our vision series. And I want you to go to Luke chapter seven with me today because last week we came around an anointing moment in John 12 where Mary anointed Jesus feet with expensive perfume, the essence of nard. And today I wanna come around another anointing moment if that's okay with you but this time at a meal with a Pharisee. Check it out, Luke chapter seven, verse 36, it says, one of the Pharisees asked Jesus to have dinner with him. So Jesus went to his home and sat down to eat. When a certain immoral woman from that city heard he was eating there, she brought a beautiful alabaster jar filled with expensive perfume. And then she knelt down behind him at his feet weeping. Her tears fell on his feet and she wiped them off with her hair. Then she kept kissing his feet and putting perfume on them. When the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would have known, he would know what kind of woman is touching him. She is a sinner. And Jesus answered his thoughts. Simon, he said to the Pharisee, I have, I have something to say to you. Go ahead, teacher, Simon replied. Then Jesus told him a story 
A man loaned money to two people, 500 pieces of silver to one and 50 pieces to the other, but neither of them could repay him. So he kindly forgave them both, canceling their debts. Who do you suppose loved him more after that? Simon answered, I suppose the one from whom he canceled the larger debt. That's right, Jesus said. Then he turned to the woman and said to Simon, look at this woman kneeling here. When I entered your home, you didn't offer me water to wash the dust from my feet, but she has washed them with her tears and wiped them with her head. You didn't greet me with a kiss, but from the time I first came in, she hasn't stopped kissing my feet. You neglected the courtesy of olive oil to anoint my head, but she has anointed my feet with rare perfume. I tell you, her sins, and they are many, have been forgiven. So she has shown much love. But a person who is forgiven little shows only a little love. Only a little, little love. Just a little bit, just a little love. Today I wanna talk about the church. And in this vision season, we are centering around pursuing a permanent building. I wanna make sure we understand exactly what we're building, especially as we anticipate moving into that building. I wanna make sure we get it right, what it is that we are building. And I wanna do that with a sermon I'm entitling, Not Your Average Church. Not Your Average Church. And, and, and you don't know this yet, but I'm so glad you came out today. You are about to be blessed by the Word of God that is living and active and will produce fruit in your life if the soil is ready for it. So I want you to do something in preparation for the Word of God. I want you to find three of the best looking people around you. You get to choose, you get to select, find three of them and give them a little fist bump or an elbow bump and welcome them, thank them for sitting next to you. Go ahead, go ahead, come on San Francisco. You can do it as well in Palo Alto. Welcome people, welcome people. And then go ahead and take your seats. So as I said last week, we established what makes the best church ever. And dare I say, it wasn't what you thought because what we discovered is what makes the best church ever is not based on what the church provides for you, but what the church requires of you. What it asks of me, what it requires of me, which actually in turn turns out what makes the best life ever as well. That that same environment of challenge that that same environment of stretching by faith, the, the same environment where I discover my gifts and I discover my calling and I discover a capacity I never knew I had comes out of the environment that expects a lot from me. It's the best church ever. And honestly, it's only when you approach the church in this way can you actually fully appreciate what God has commissioned us to build. Only when you approach it from this lens can you fully appreciate what it is that God has called us as the people of God to, to build. In fact, I have found it very easy in life to not appreciate fully a lot of things, not just the church. In fact, for example, I got to tell you about Pastor Vlad, our Morgan Hill campus pastor. Pastors Vlad and Jean, they've been a part of our community pretty much since the beginning, since the conception of the church or close to it. And I would have to say that, that Vlad is one of the funniest humans I've ever met in my life. One of the funniest human beings. Whether you're laughing with him or at him, it is, he is just amazing to be around. And I've spent I've spent time with Vlad in Israel. I've spent time with Vlad in Italy. And each and every time there is a new story I get about Vlad that I love to tell and I love to share. And just because he's, everything Vlad does is funny. In fact, a couple years ago, there was a few of us on staff. We, we decided to join a, uh, join a CrossFit gym. And so we're in this CrossFit gym and we're doing what all CrossFitters do is we're talking about CrossFit. <laughs> like what you say? Work, we're talking about how much we're lifting and the workouts and, and, and Vlad's overhearing this and Vlad thinks, that sounds awesome. I want to get in on this. And so Vlad decides to join up to the gym and we're, we're at the gym and it's always fascinating to me because when, when Vlad came to the gym, you've got to remember he's Ukrainian, so he can lift stuff. Like he was just lifting weight like, like, like he's been there forever. He's just born lifting weights. It's, Ukrainian, and, and, so, and so he comes to, to CrossFit, first day there, just lifting heavy weight. We're all impressed, this is amazing. But each time afterward, like we would turn up, Vlad would look, out what, look at what the workout of the day was and go, Ugh. <laughs> like every time. Like, is there something you didn't like about this, Vlad? And then next week he'd come, he'd be like, Ugh. 
That's what we're doing today. He would complain about the workout at the gym. And I had to ask one time, Vlad, what did you expect? Like, did you come expecting that today we're going to have donuts? <laughs> Like, like, like today, we're just going to sit around and just going to chat and we're going to bring some coffee in and no, 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 you paid money to be in pain. That's the gym. You paid money to lift heavy weights and do it furiously and sweat through both your shirts and that, that's what you paid. What did you expect? Sometimes I feel like asking the church that. Well, when, when, you, when you came in here, what, what did you expect? What was your expectation of the church that is? Because, and honestly, I think if we're going to identify what is the best church ever, I think it's imperative that we have a firm understanding around what the church actually is. That why don't we do that? Why don't we do a little, little bit of time, spend a little bit of time at the beginning of this sermon, correctly unpacking a theological perspective around what the church is, just so we know what to expect. Yeah. Just so we know, no matter what background we come from, no matter what experience or no, what, no matter what frame of mind we come from, that we can all together actually be aligned around our understanding of the church. And Scripture is a good place to start. Because throughout the New Testament, what you're going to find is articulations of and directions for us, the church. However, in Ephesians particularly, what you'll find is it holds some, some pretty direct instructions from Paul concerning this thing called the church. For example, in Ephesians 1, we find the apostle helping us understand the makeup of the church. He says right from the beginning of his letter in Ephesians 1.22, he says, God has put all things under the authority of Christ and has made him head over all things for the benefit of the church. And the church is his body. It is made full and complete by Christ who fills all things everywhere with himself. So according to Scripture, the church is the body of Christ of which Jesus is the head. Jesus is a part of the church. Jesus is the head of the church. You are also part of the church as the body of the church. Many different parts, but part of the body. Now, it's also important to note, it was Jesus Himself who first established the idea of the church when speaking to the disciples in Matthew chapter 16. You might remember it. Jesus was speaking to the disciples and upon, upon uh, the revelation of Peter that He was the Messiah, Jesus said, upon this rock, I will build my church. That was the first mention of the church. That was the first concept of the church. You can imagine the disciples who had never heard the church in that context saying, what? What, what, what are we going to build? But Jesus puts it out there. We're going to build my church. We, we love that. The disciples are like, okay, more detail, please. There was no concept of the church before Jesus said that. And from there, we actually begin to see after the ascension of Jesus in the early church, that the church through Acts, through the Acts of the Apostles and through through the leadership of the apostles and through the spreading of the saints from Jerusalem into outer areas, we see the church begin to gain momentum. Now, now universally, is it okay if I do, I don't want to turn this into a seminar, but I could do some teaching. Because universally, we understand that the church is made up of everybody who's ever been born again. That's, that's the universal church. However, the church locally is, is represented by an assembly or in a gathering of Christians who are called to that particular community. Yeah. And the mobilization of the believers is always outworked through the local church. Yes, exactly. You see, while there is certainly a universal expression of the church, which includes every Christian that professes Jesus as Lord, it's, it's the local church through, through which the activation and and the assignment of each believer is commissioned and ordained and released and given authority. It's through the expression of the local church. It's, it's in surrender to God and submission to leadership where anointing is identified. And already I said two nasty words that push people out of the church. You want me to surrender to God? You want me to submit to leadership? That's That's... That's a result of the universal church concept. Yes. And sometimes you'll, you'll find people who don't like just being part of the body. They want to be the whole body. They want to be the whole, they want to be the whole body. 
I was talking to a pastor one time and he was telling me a story about this, this guy that he, he met who was like a freelance minister and he was asking him for some financial support for his itinerant ministry. And the pastor asked him, what, what ministry uh, group are you connected to or are you associated with? To which the man replied, uh, my ministry is universal. He's talking about the universal church. The pastor said, okay, then, well, well which, which church are you a part of? And the man said, well, I'm a part of the invisible church. Now getting really suspicious, my friend asked him, well, where does, where does the invisible church meet and, and who pastors it? The man became so frustrated with him. He said, well, it isn't limited to a, to a location like this place. We're invisible because we're the only true church. The pastor then grabbed something and just said, hold out your hands. And he put something in his hands. The guy said, what was that? And he said, that's invisible cash for the invisible church. See, the Bible says the church is, church is very tangible because it's made up of parts of the body. And as the parts come together, then you have the church. In fact, being planted in the church always follows being connected to Christ. God wants to connect you to Himself, but He wants you to plant in the church. The idea of being planted is allowing your roots to be established to find life and to find a place where you can flourish. In fact, while we, we could certainly spend a whole lot of time articulating what the church is, sometimes it's just helpful to know what the church isn't. Yeah. Sometimes that's an easier approach. For example, and this needs to be said, the church isn't a building. Now, we're certainly trying to buy a building, don't get me wrong. However, the church is not a building. Instead, what the church is, is the people being built together that represent the house of God. Another way to put it is we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. As Paul reveals in his first letters to the Corinthians in chapter 3, 16, he says, don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple and that God's Spirit lives in you? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him. Yo, for God's temple is sacred and you are that temple. Now, a physical building is certainly helpful and dare I even say essential to meeting together and worshipping together and facilitating training, equipping and mobilising of the saints. However, the church and what God is building with the church is the only eternal element on earth. The church is the only eternal element on earth. Everything will fade away. Everything will be replaced. Everything will be renewed. But what will remain is the church. I got four Bible scholars nodding at me. Everyone knows I didn't take that seminary class yet, Pastor. Just go with me, go with me. In fact, another thing the church isn't is the church isn't powerless. Since Acts chapter 2, we find that the church has been moving rapidly under the power of the Holy Spirit. And when the church is gathered with two or three people, that's what the Bible says, that's where the, there is potential in the atmosphere. And the atmosphere becomes ripe with power and miracles are, are able to be experienced and happen where, where, where people come together, where the people, where the church gathers. The, the people just takes two or three. Two or three. Why does it take two or three? Because you can't be the church on your own. You're the church together, not alone. So it's not a formula where we need to get two or three, but just more than one. That's what the Scripture is saying. At least more than one. At least, at least come together. Let's have a left arm and a right arm. Let's, let's, let's have, we're parts of the body. This is what makes the church powerful. It's the authority of Jesus and the activity of the Holy Spirit setting people free and releasing gifts. In fact, Jesus also followed up His statement when He was speaking to, to Peter he said, upon this rock, I will build the church. But then he proceeds to say that the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Like his second statement about the church, or in fact, his first statement, other than saying, I will build my church upon this foundation. So it's going to be solid. The very next thing he says about the church, it is powerful. Wow. Wow. Even the gates of hell will not prevail. Wow. Nothing can stop the church. Wow. Nothing can hold back the church. Wow. Nothing can prevent the church from its power and its mission. Paul also reveals in Ephesians 3.20, talking about power. And now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than we ask or imagine according to his power that is at work within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. 
Paul wants to make sure you understand that the church isn't powerless. The church is not passive. The church is not poor. The church is a powerful body of Jesus Christ, of which He is the head. Jesus is a part of the church. Jesus is in the church. Truth is, you see, the church is moving in mission. We have been commissioned by Jesus to proclaim the good news of salvation to all mankind, to all humankind. And so the church is meant to build up and to train believers for special service. The church is meant to to praise the Lord through worship while demonstrating Christian compassion to all who suffer. And there is so much that we could say about the church. But one thing that does need to be said is that Jesus loves the church. Like He loves the church. Like if Jesus, I know Jesus loves you. This I know the Bible told me so. What Jesus loves is the church. Like He loves you individually. You can feel warm and snuggy about that. But what Jesus is really passionate is about you together with you and with you. And when we all get together as the church and begin to mobilize in the mission that He has commissioned us together. He loves the church. Ephesians 5.25 says that for husbands, This means loves your wives just as Christ loved the church. He gave up His life for her to make her holy and clean, washed by the cleansing of God's Word. He he did this to present her to Himself as a glorious church without spot or wrinkle or any other blemish. Instead, she will be holy and without fault. Now, if the church is the bride of Christ, then if Jesus gave up His life for the church, here's my question. Why are we so comfortable with criticising the church? If this is coming across savage today, it was fully intended. Like if if we just established and there is so much more we could go on, but for the sake of turning this into a seminar, let's stop the teaching moment here. Let me ask a question. If this is Jesus' heart for the church, that He is the head of the church, He is part of the church, that He loves the church, He gave up His life for the church, how is it that human beings are so, so, so quick to criticize the church? Why? Why is that? I'm wondering if it has to do with us treating what's sacred as what's common. Ignore that. That's just the kids having the time of their life. They're safe. They're safe. That's what joy sounds like. That's what the church sounds like. That's what, that's happiness. Some of you are like, can I go in there? Yeah. I wonder if it has to do with us treating what's sacred as, as common. Uh, or maybe even seeing the church as something I attend rather than something I am. So, <sighs> seminar done, let's preach now. In fact, this is what we see here in Luke 7. This scene has so many similarities to the passage that we studied last week in John 12. I mean, in both instances, you have a woman who is sparing no expense in their worship and and adoration of Jesus, pouring out expensive perfume. We we looked at the value of that. We, we We saw how much that was lavishing upon Jesus as Mary came in. Her brother Lazarus had been risen from the dead. We're two days out from, from, from Jesus going to the cross and in preparation for all that she knew in her heart he was about to do and everything that she had done. There was like an overflow. It was an offering. It, was, it wasn't just dabbed out. It wasn't just kind of measured out. It was like lavished upon God. Just break that thing. Pour it out. God, all that I am is all that you have. This was the heart of Mary. And we saw that last week. And, and yet here we see in both instances, we also have two men critical about the situation going on. It's crazy. Both instances. In John 12, it was Judas Iscariot. We all know about him who was critical about the waste of money. He knew the value of it. He knew exactly what that was costing and he was offended. Not offended because of how that money could have been used. Offended that he wasn't getting part of it. It's critical. Bitter. Critical. Even in a moment of extreme worship and adoration, just sitting there judging. Not, Not aware of the moment, but just judging the moment. 
reviewing the moment. <laughs> we love the church reviewers. Reviewing <laughs> what was going on. That was in John 12. Here in Luke 7, we have Simon the Pharisee who is judging Jesus for allowing such a woman to wash his feet, a sinner, a sinner, a sinful woman. Sinful. There are so many ways I would love to dissect and preach this passage. The fact that she was familiar with the house anyway, enough to walk in there and interrupt a dinner party and begin to wash the feet. The fact that this Pharisee knew who she was. There, there's so many things about the passage I'd love to preach, but I'm going to stay on course. I'm going to stay, stay in my lane. The similarities between both stories, both anointing moments. And I love the way Luke records this because he says it this way in verse 40. He says, then Jesus answered his thoughts. I love this so much. Here we've got Jesus in the house. You've got, he's been invited by a Pharisee. And I love that because Jesus ate with everybody. Didn't matter if they were a known sinner, tax collector, whatever, or if they're a religious leader in the community. He's like, I'll eat the, you just invite me. In fact, if you just invite Jesus, he'll come. You, you, you just invite Jesus, he'll come. It doesn't matter what your background's been like. It doesn't matter what you've done up until this point. One invitation to Jesus, he will step right in without hesitation. And what we find here is he comes, he says, yeah, I'll come and eat at your house. I don't know if the Pharisee was expecting a yes. I thought maybe he was hoping to, to prove that Jesus won't eat with us. But Jesus just takes the invitation. He steps right in for a meal. And in the middle of this meal, this how weird would this be? I don't know what the conversation was happening before then. I feel like it was a little tense just from the context. However, what made it more tense was this woman. Now, she was a known sinner. And so we, we, we can probably assume that there was a, 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 an outward lifestyle that represented her lifestyle. And so she comes in dressed like she probably would have been dressed out in the world, but comes in and starts breaking perfume at the dinner table. Wow. Like completely ignoring the situation and the scene, ignoring everything that was going on around, ignoring who was at the table, who could have probably pulled her out and stoned her in the streets, completely bold because something had come over her to acknowledge the grace and the forgiveness that Jesus had in offer. So comes in not sparing one expense, but breaking the perfume. Her tears would have been flooding enough to be drenching her feet, Jesus' feet where she had to wipe them with her hair. I mean, this scene is pretty emotional. This scene is intense. And then we've got a Pharisee who's like, if he knew, if, hmm, oh, maybe he ain't such a prophet. We know who she is. <laughs> he, he obviously doesn't know who she is. And then Luke says, he answers his thoughts. Right when he's saying he mustn't be a prophet, he answers, this is a flex if I've ever seen one. Literally, oh. Oh. Answers his so it's, and I love this because Simon wasn't even saying it. He was, he was thinking it. And yet Jesus arrests his thought. In fact, can I tell you the only way to ever change your thoughts is to first arrest your thoughts. This is, this is how Paul instructs us in 2 Corinthians 10, 5. He says, we demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. Just because you think a thought doesn't mean you speak a thought. Anyone ever met anybody that just says, I'm just, just speaking what I think? Just speaking my mind. Anybody met those people? Anybody know those people? Anybody a sibling that does that? Just, just, think, just speaking what I think? Well, don't. <laughs> don't. Like you don't need to see that as noble. Oh, wow. Look how real and authentic and free they are to speak what they think. That ain't noble. Just say, don't. Do that. Normal people arrest thoughts. It's not the fact that you had the thought. It's the fact that you didn't arrest the thought. You skip the filter that you're meant to have and say, hey, I should not speak that. I should, even though I thought it, I need to arrest it. I need to arrest it. 
saying what you think. What about think about what you say? That's what you should do. Don't just say whatever comes to mind. That's dangerous. You need to train your mind. Train your mind. Train your mind. Tra- look at your neighbor and say, train your mind. <laughs> You've got you to train your mind. Take captive those thoughts. Philippians 4, 8, finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. That's called training your mind. Instead of listening to the media and getting filled with negativity and all day you're thinking about the atrocities of the world and all day you're churning over those things and then you're trying to have faith to stretch, but you wonder why I'm stuck in fear. You need to arrest some thoughts and think about it. what is lovely, what is pure, what is holy, what is excellent. Begin to train your mind and arrest some thoughts. This is such practical pastoring to to train your mind. And Jesus, if He speaks to His thoughts, then Jesus will arrest our thoughts too. In fact, the way David put it, he said, search my heart. Like even before it gets to a thought, because everything you think originates from what you believe. And so, so David went a step earlier in the process and said, check my heart. Check any wicked way within me, God, God cleanse it, fix it, deal with it. And so, and, so, and so Jesus, just because you didn't say it doesn't mean you don't need to arrest it. Just because you didn't say it doesn't mean you don't need to correct it in your life. Help me preach somebody. Just because it didn't actually come out or it wasn't a conversation and you didn't actually gossip, but you thought about that thing, doesn't mean you don't go before God and say, God, would you just cleanse my mind? Because uh, I feel like there's some bitter things taken over my mind. Every time I think about something and look at something, I'm having these thoughts about that person. Oh, she wearing that again. Oh, here she is showing us. Like everything keeps taking over my thoughts. And just because it doesn't come out does not mean it's not toxic to your life. What if we were more accountable for our thoughts? What if we were more accountable for what happened in the secret parts of our mind and saying, God, I don't want to just present one thing, but be thinking another thing. God, let my thoughts line up with my actions. Let the integrity of my life be consistent with who you've called me to be. Arrest my thoughts, arrest my thoughts. Jesus speaks to his thoughts, and I check this out. He takes it even further than in verse 44. He says, then he, he turned to the woman and said to Simon. Now, this is awesome. This is, this is, this is a great pastoral moment because he puts the focus on the woman, but he's making sure you, you over there, I'm talking to you. I ain't done with you, but I'm making this about you. And he uses this moment to, to teach something. He says, then turning to the woman, he said to Simon, look at this woman kneeling here. When I entered your home, you didn't offer me water to wash the dust from my feet, but she has washed them with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You didn't greet me with a kiss, but from the time I first came in, she hasn't stopped kissing my feet. You neglected the courtesy of olive oil to anoint my head, but she has anointed my feet with red perfume. Now, now, Jesus was highlighting the fact that Simon the Pharisee dishonoured Jesus merely by treating Him as common. And what this woman did was she revealed the contrast between what it looks like to treat something as sacred and what it looks like to treat something as common. That's what her display did. It emphasised just how common the Pharisee treated Jesus because she comes in lavishing, loving, worshipping upon Jesus. And what was able to be contrasted in the moment is you didn't even none of these things. Not even the common cultural courtesy of that day. The common cultural courtesy, not even one reserved for someone important, but the common cultural courtesy that when you walked into somebody's house, you got water to wash the dust off your feet, you got some olive oil to, to put in the hair, and the, the common cultural courtesy, you didn't even offer me that. What was that saying? I mean, can you imagine? You have Jesus coming into your home. Jesus, the creator of the world, 
the Son of God, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the name above all names, the lily of the valley, the shadow of the Lamb. We've got the Messiah. We've got the Great One. We've got the Perfector and the Author of our own faith. We've got the Creator of the world, Emmanuel, Deliverer. We've got the Great High Priest. We've got our Great Council, the Lion of the Tribe of Judah, the Resurrection and the Life. And yet you treat Him as common. Like you've got, this is what's in your home and treat it as just another dinner guest. Just another Sunday. Just another worship song. I won't sing this one. I don't like this one. I'm trying to rein it in. Next service, I'm going to let it loose. I'm telling you. In fact, this whole scene here is fascinating and dare I say, holds some deeper connection to the anointing service that we see or the anointing moment that we see in John 14, even beyond what's seen on the surface. Can I reveal it to you? Oh, this is gonna help some people because the connections are insanely deep. Not just from what you think. Yeah, two women, both anointing, both expensive perfume, two critics. But even deeper than that on a, Way deeper level, we have a connection that is highlighted by John. You see, in John 14, we find upon Mary anointing Jesus' feet. The New King James Version, which is actually very similar to what it says in the original, highlights and emphasises something that many translations leave out, maybe just because it seemed redundant. A lot of the translations take out something that seems redundant, so we'll take that out. But the danger of missing... What is actually meant to be included is the revelation that comes from that. You see, in the New King James, how many people read from the New King James? Anybody? Okay, you're already smarter than all of us because what we have here, and let me, let me revisit. In fact, we could put this up on the screen. I believe I gave it to the team. There we go. It says, but, but one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, who would betray him said, why was this fragrant oil not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? Now, did you notice something there? It says... Can we go back? One of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son. Now, now the reason this is weird is because John already established which Judas it was. The reason that in Scripture you'll find Judas's name always mentioned with his last name, Iscariot, is because there were two Judases in Jesus' squad. That sucks, you know what I mean? Like we've got another Pastor Adam on staff. That gets confusing. Put it back up, come on. And, and so what we have, and kind of rightly so, all the translators have looked at this and said, too much detail, we already know which Judas it is. But I believe that John wanted us to make a connection. This is Judas Iscariot, Simon's, Son, it seems a little redundant. John, why would you include his lineage? Why would you include who his father is? Well, what you need to know is that many biblical scholars believe that Judas's father, Simon, is actually Simon the Pharisee, whose house Jesus is eating at in Luke 7. The very fact that, Jesus, that Judas could so easily go and sell Jesus out is because it wasn't just some Pharisees, it was a group his father was connected to. Stay with me, stay with me, stay with me. This is gonna, this is gonna, this is gonna drop right into your soul. And what we see in Luke 7 is we see a situation where, 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 where Judas's father is not just, not criticising, but, but treating as common. Now, I believe that John wanted us to make the connection so that we would understand that whatever we treat as common will always give birth to criticism. <laughs> whatever we treat as common will always give birth in our life to criticism. Here you've got Simon the Pharisee who is just treating Jesus as common. It's another guest, whatever. Don't need to go about all the details. He's lucky to be in my house. And yet what that produced, the offspring of his life was criticism. (laughs) 
the offspring of His life. Now, now you might argue, I would never treat Jesus as common. Well, what about what He loves, the church? How do we treat that as common, Pastor? Well, for instance, anytime you have a conversation around whether or not we should go to church this Sunday, you've treated the church as common. Anytime. Oh, but you know, I know the conversations. Uh, the kids have had a big weekend in sport. You know, we've got to get them ready for school. You know, it's COVID and everything. We've got to keep them healthy for school. <laughs> or it's like football season today, honey. Like it's 13 weeks, but church is all the weeks. I'm just going to keep going until I hit somebody's like target, until I hit the bullseye. <laughs> but we work all week and you know, it's okay to take some time to go to Napa for ourselves. It's fine. And I'm not saying this wrong. I'm not going to put this in the category of sin. I'm not saying you're sinful because you didn't come to church. I know some people that can get too religious about it. They're on vacation and they're going to find a church and they're sitting in there just, thank you, Lord. <sighs> made it to church. No. No, it's about treating it as common. We could, we need to rest. And misappropriating the significance of what it is that we're a part of and what you end up treating as common, you end up criticizing. I guarantee the conversations that will flow will go from, to, it'll go to they instead of we. <laughs> like they really talk about money a lot here. <laughs> They really need to do something about the parking. Have you tried to park and go to that church? I thought it was we before now. It's we until we make a mistake and now it's they. I was walking around last weekend. I'm saying happy birthday, everyone. It was the ninth birthday. Do you know how many of you just said happy birthday to me? What? No, it's our church. It's not happy birthday to me. It's happy birthday to we. Are you with me? See, see, this is what it is. This is what it is to treat it as common. You disconnect from it. You sit on the outside. And when you treat it as common and casual, what will always be produced in your life is criticism. The enemy will actually, his goal is to remove you from the church. His goal is to isolate you. This has been his goal from the garden. He could not, he could not corrupt Adam and Eve together. But if I could get one of them alone, if I could say, did God said, if he can get you out on the fringe away, isolated, disconnected, just treating it as common, every thought will come in. Everything will invade your mind. And before you know it, you are so far from the purpose of heaven for your life. You can't even recognize it's, it's critical. This is how I know that people can review a church. <laughs> it's how crazy, audacious, and ignorant people can be to write their perfect, articulated review of a church because they've treated it as common. Not because they're a professional or an expert, but because they're critical. Their spirit has become like Judas. This is how you recognize a Judas spirit by treating something as common that Christ is called sacred. He gave up his life for the church. I wanna see how you feel if someone wrote a review about your wife. Leave it, okay. Now the reason you will treat a church as common is because you see it as something you attend rather than something I am. It's something you attend, it's something you turn up at, just attend. Are you, are you glad I'm here? Where's my seat? Oh, I gotta behave. The church is not a place you turn up to. It's a people called to each other and to God. You see, I'd love to preach a whole sermon about the fact that when you are called of God, God calls you to a people as well. So, so your commitment isn't just to God, your commitment is one to another. Ah, there's so many things I want to say. I wish I had time to preach this some more. I really do. I... We'll just pick up in the next service. But do you know what makes a church average? 
It's not the preaching. It's not the setting. It's not the parking or the programs. I wanna make sure we know this when we level up in our experience and we go into a permanent building that now it's not all of a sudden, oh, the church is better. If we can't be committed to Christ here, we won't be committed to Christ when it's more convenient. So I've got a deep burden in my spirit to make sure I pastor us right, not just take us into a convenient place and then the church is better, that we have a full conviction on who God is calling us to be. And what makes the church average is not all the stuff, the programs, the seats, the parking, it's you. You make it average. The way you hold it in your heart, I mean. The way that you hold it, the way that you treat it as casual or sacred. See, at that dinner, we see two people, two different postures. One treating as common, one treating as sacred. The fact that I get to be in the house of God. The fact that I get to be called to a community of people. The fact that I get the freedom to lift my hands and glorify God. The fact that I get to, I'm treating this as sacred. And if there is something I don't like, I'm arresting that thought. I'm arresting that thought. I'm gonna take that thought captive. I'm not gonna let that thought begin to be like a seed in my mind that ends up corrupting my soul. Would you stand to your feet? I have to finish. Treating it as, treating it as common. This ain't just your average church. This ain't just your average church. I wonder if there's an area of your life and this is a beautiful moment where I'm gonna lead us into repentance. It's biblical. Biblical to have moments of repentance before God, to cleanse your life and to renew your heart, to renew your commitment to Christ. It's a powerful posture and there has to be the question, God, search my heart, where have I treated your church as common? Where have I treated your church as casual? Because repentance restores the heart. And I can guarantee you, Vive Church is not your average church unless you treat it that way. Unless you treat it that way. So would you do something? I wanna just lead us in a moment of repentance. I know what God is setting up for the church. I know the revival that God has spoken to me about. I know the impact that God has spoken to me about but it's not gonna come from a casual approach to the kingdom or to His house. The house of God, the church, the place where His presence dwells, the place where the people come and gather and worship Him and lift His Name and glorify Him, the place where the people of God partner together, where their gifts are realised and the anointing is released and they are commissioned, trained and equipped to do the work of the ministry as we see in Ephesians 4. That place is sacred, is sacred. I want to come before God and repent if we've treated it as common or casual. So would you lift your hands? If you dare, I'm, not, I'm just inviting, it's an invitation. To say, God, search my heart. What have I treated as casual or common? Where's the level of my sacredness? Have I criticised? Have I held it in contempt? Have I judged the church through mere human beings? What's crazy is most criticism we have of the church or of the humans within the church. Somehow holding those humans to a higher standard than we hold ourselves. God, we come with repentance. Do you know what repentance is? Repentance talks about a 180 degree turn. To say, I was going this way, but because I repent, I'm going a different way. So when you repent, you have to decide in your heart how you're gonna hold something. I'm not gonna hold it that way, I'm gonna hold it this way. I'm gonna hold it for you. I'm not gonna have that conversation, should we or shouldn't we? I, as for me in my house, we serve the Lord. I'm establishing something for generations to come. I pray for the parents that prioritise their kids' emotional energy 
over being, having them in the house of God and expecting why when they're teenagers, they don't wanna pursue it for themselves. But to show the discipline because we prioritise this. God is moving moving in the house, moving in our house, moving in the house of God, moving in our home. So God, we commit to hold what You love and what You gave Your life up for as sacred. We commit in our heart to lift up Your church. We commit to pray for the church. We commit to arrest our thoughts, to bind the enemy, to bind that voice of negativity and to speak life and hope to build the church, not just with our action, but with our words and our thoughts. God, cleanse our hearts, wash us anew, redeem us from inside out. 